Hey everybody. So we are talking about the core values of the upper room. And the, uh, the idea is, the truth is, that the invitation of Jesus to all of us is to become disciples of his, to become uh, citizens of the kingdom of God here on earth and live the values of the kingdom. And today we're going to continue to talk about our first value, and that is treasuring God's presence. And as we're going to continue to see, everything about the kingdom really goes against what we would otherwise think is normal, which means as kingdom people, we're called to be abnormal. Some of us have no problem with that. But we're called to be peculiar people in all the right ways, the same ways that Jesus was peculiar. And if you don't know, I'm, um, I'm one of those kind of boring eggheads who like to spend time reading about the early church and uh, other stuff that nobody else really cares about. And once in a while, I kind of let the inner nerd out. And I appreciate that you all put up with that. Uh, that's going to happen for a bit today. Today, uh, the, the first part of this, this talk is going to be me kind of just nerding out. And today it will be even more difficult because you're not even going to know why I'm telling you what I'm telling you for a while. But I can almost guarantee that you'll see why uh, if you'll just kind of hang with me. So, so here we go. Um, the, the early church wrestled with a lot of theological and philosophical problems. One of the major problems they wrestled with was how Jesus could be fully God and fully human. The Bible says Jesus is fully God. The Bible says Jesus is fully human. And they wrestled with how do you, do you put that together? Now, you might think, yeah, it wouldn't be so difficult, right? John just tells us that the, the Word, which is God, was made flesh, made His dwelling among us. So, God was made flesh. What's difficult about that? God's all-powerful. He can do whatever He wants. He decided to be God in, in a new way, as this man, Jesus Christ. What's the problem? Well, the early church had a big problem with this, not in believing it, but in trying to make sense out of it. And uh, part of the problem was that there was, a, there was a highly esteemed philosophical tradition that went back actually before Plato. It's now call, called negative theology. It's the study of what God is not rather than what he is. This tradition was started with philosophers and became kind of the dominant way of thinking about God in the ancient world. And in this tradition, what they did is they sort of just they just kind of thought their way into a definition of God. And the basic premise of negative theology is that God's so far beyond human understanding that the only hope we have of getting close to the nature of God is to list what God definitely is not. And the way they arrived at this definition of God was by contrasting God with human beings in the world. So if something defined humanity or the world they would negate that from their definition of God. So for example, they saw that time is a constant part of the human experience. So they said, well then, God must be above time, completely timeless. And his, his world is always changing and humans are always changing. And so they posited that God, every aspect, not just his character or his essence, but in every respect, God doesn't change. And they came, they came to the view that passion and suffering were signs of weakness. And so they defined God as being above emotion, above passion, above all suffering. Um, the, the people in the world changes, and so God must be immutable, meaning he doesn't change. And these ideas defined what became the normal view of God. And what you need to know is that the early church, when this whole thing was getting launched, some intellectuals were converted into the Christian movement. And uh, some of them brought this normal view of God with them. And to a large degree, many folks at the time accepted the normal view of God as being altogether timeless, altogether unchanging, altogether passionless, above emotion and suffering. And if you accept that view of God, you have a hard time making sense out of Jesus being fully God and fully human. Because to say Jesus is fully God and fully human with that normal definition of God means Jesus is both fully timeless and yet as a human he is fully temporal. 
And Jesus says God is beyond change, completely immutable, changeless, and yet God's very changing because he became flesh. And God is both above passion and suffering and yet was fully involved in passion and suffering. And how do you put these, these two things together? It's like they're trying to pack a timeless, changeless, passionless definition of God into this person of Jesus Christ. And it just didn't fit very well. And it was like trying to explain how some substance could be fully, fully and completely gold and fully and completely silver. Not partly gold and partly silver, not a mixture of the two, but fully both at the same time. When you know very well to be silver is not to be gold, and to be gold is not to be silver. And it's really quite a pickle. And they wrestled with this, and they talked about it, and they debated it, and they finally came up with what was considered the, the orthodox solution at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And the solution is to say that Jesus is fully God and fully human. And these two natures, these, these are, us, are substances relating together in such a way that, here's a quote, they are unconfusedly, interchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one substance. So, I think that pretty much clears it up. Right? That's a lot of words that don't say much of anything at all. It doesn't help us understand how Jesus is fully God and fully human. But given how they kind of set up the problem, I don't know if they could have done any better than that. Here's the problem. They started with what they thought they knew about God, their normal definition of God, and then they tried to fit Jesus into it. They assumed they knew who God is and what God is like ahead of time, and then discovered that it's very hard to reconcile that view of God with the person of Jesus Christ. And I said all that to say, I think we in various ways do this too. Some of us without knowing it, we assume a normal view of God that we inherited from the culture. And it, it feels normal to us, it's commonsensical to us. Then we try to fit Jesus into it. The trouble is that our normal view of God is inherited from a fallen culture, which is why many Christians have profoundly, um, I'll say it this way, sub-Christian views of God. They maybe have the right creed, they maybe have what they think is the right theology, maybe they can even recite the Chalcedon Creed, but when it comes to how they actually picture God in their head, it's very sub-Christian because of trying to fit Jesus into what they already think they know about God, rather than the other way around. The same thing can be said about the kingdom uh, or about Christian living. We, you know, discipleship, we tend to assume we know what the kingdom is and we know what Christian living is, and then we try to fit the teachings of Jesus into our normal definition. That's why many Christians don't differ very much at all from the culture, because they basically assume the normality of the culture and then fit Jesus into it. So all the studies done on this suggest that the majority of American Christians differ very little from the non-Christians. That's because they're absorbing the normal and then fitting Jesus in as an addition. We just do what all the other normal people do, but we do it in Jesus' name. So we seek after comfort and wealth and security and power. And because we want those things, it seems normal to assume that one of God's main interests is to provide us with those things, with comfort, wealth, security, and power. Despite the fact that Jesus warned us against seeking after comfort, wealth, security, and power. All of this is because we tend to start our thinking about God and the kingdom with our normal ideas about how things work. And then we try to fit Jesus and his teachings into it. Other rather than the other way around. So just as with the Council of Chalcedon, we end up trying to mix together gold and silver, and it just doesn't work. And I want to submit to you that rather than starting with their, our normal view of God and our normal view of Christian living, and then trying to fit Jesus into it, we ought to start all of our thinking from beginning to end with Jesus Christ, and then readjust our normal accordingly. We need to start with Jesus' teachings and then 
jettison everything that we might have considered normal, but doesn't agree with what we find to be true in the person of Jesus Christ. I, I think during this Values in the Kingdom series, it would actually be beneficial to actually like pretend like we don't know anything about what it means to be a Christian. And then just start fresh and look at Jesus and let him tell us who God is. Let him tell us what it is to walk in his ways, to value what he values, to be Christ-like. And everything that we would think would be normal that doesn't conform with that, we need to get rid of. And when we, when we do that, when we start with Jesus Christ and stay focused on him, we will discover that there's very little that's normal about God. And there's very little that's normal about being a disciple of Jesus. In fact, when Jesus is um, the center of our definition of God and the center of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, almost everything we would think would be normal is reversed. And that's what so many of our values are about. So we learn as we look at Jesus that God is powerful, and that's normal. But this powerful God reveals his power through the weakness of the cross. So how normal is that? God is victorious, yes, but he accomplishes his victory by be, being defeated or looking like he's defeated on Calvary. That isn't normal. God is wise, but he reveals his wisdom through the foolishness of the cross. God, God's supremacy over all things is revealed in the humility of a sacrifice, sacrificial death. God's holiness is revealed not in the way the Pharisees did it. That wasn't true holiness. God's holiness is revealed in the way that he hangs out with and accepts and even parties with the worst of sinners. When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, everything we would think would be normal about God tends to be reversed. And if we start all of our thinking about God with the fact that God became a man in Jesus Christ, well, then we no longer have any problem of trying to mix gold and silver. We no longer have any problem of trying to pack a timeless, changeless, passionless being into a temporal, changing, suffering human. If we start with Jesus Christ and stay focused on Jesus Christ, you simply accept at the start that this is what God looks like. When God becomes a human, he's not becoming something different to himself. But actually, when God becomes a human in the person of Jesus, he's finally, fully expressing what he's really like what his character really is. Like, you see glimpses of the true character of God in the Old Testament, but in the, the person of Jesus Christ, you see the essence of who God is. Jesus said in John 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. When we, when we see him, when our eyes are focused on Jesus Christ, we see who God is. And he's not some passionless, all-controlling, metaphysical principle. He's a personal God whose very essence is love, a love that's defined by the fact that he takes upon himself our humanity and takes upon himself our sin, takes upon himself our judgment in order to reconcile us to himself. That's what God's really like. But you only get there if you start with Jesus and end with Jesus and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And our call as Jesus followers is very simple, but very challenging. It's to become a disciple of Jesus. It's to love like him. It's to live like him. It's to value what he values. It's to serve like him. And when we do, we'll discover that everything that may have felt normal in our lives starts to get turned upside down. It starts to get reversed. And this is what we're called to do. We're called to be aliens. We're called to be foreigners. We're called to be strangers on this earth. We follow a different king. We're part of a different kingdom with different values. We're called to be weird and notice, noticeably so. In fact, the passion of our existence, the reason why we exist is to seek first the kingdom of God, to make that the highest priority of our life, to make living out God's values the passion of our existence. And so the question we've got to live in, because this is one of those kind of questions you can't just kind of settle once and for all and then be done with it, but the question we have to live in is, are we in fact fitting Jesus in, living the kingdom into our normal, or are we letting God transform our normal into Jesus in the kingdom? 
Now that, that can kind of be difficult to un think through and understand, but honestly, understanding isn't the, the most difficult part. The really hard part is living it. We like to spend so much time just theologizing about it. It helps us actually steer clear of actually doing it. So what I want to do with the rest of our time is offer a couple of disciplines, which I think help us train for valuing the presence of God. All the spiritual disciplines in church history, I think, are good, some more than others to different people, um, because all of us are individuals, but all of them are beneficial to living in the kingdom. And if you're, if you're not aware of the spiritual disciplines, I would encourage you to read a book like um, Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline or Dallas Willard's book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. Uh, Spirit of the Disciplines is more on the, the why behind the spiritual disciplines. And Celebration of Discipline is more a how-to manual for the spiritual practices. Uh, for the rest of our time together today, I'm going to talk about two spiritual disciplines that I think are particularly important on this value specifically. The value of treasuring the presence of God. Uh, the first one is the one I talked about last week. And I'm talking about it again because I think it's so important. It is the discipline of staying aware to the Spirit of God. It's sometimes called practicing the presence of God. I believe that this is the most foundational of the spiritual disciplines. And I think the most challenging of the spiritual disciplines. But it's also the easiest of the disciplines to start. Because you can start right now. God is present right here, right now. So we just make ourselves aware of it. And also understand that you don't have to feel it or anything of the sort. It isn't necessarily about feeling anything. anything. It's just being awake, being aware that you're surrounded by the presence of God. That's the discipline. It's that simple. As we do this, as we are aware of God's presence, what it does is that goes against our normal awareness. The normal of our awareness is programmed by the fallen culture, which is why the normal of our ordinary consciousness is such that we exclude God from our awareness. We naturally just kind of think like the culture and feel like the culture, and experience the world like the culture, and therefore, of course, live like the culture. The Bible says that as a person thinks in, a, in their heart, so they are. So if you're going to make significant changes in, in how we live, we have to stay awake to the presence of God. So I encourage you, here's the assignment for the rest of the, the, the video. Stay awake to God's presence. Try to stay awake for the rest of this message in every way. Now I guarantee you'll forget in a minute, but that's okay. This is discipleship. This is practicing, not perfection. So when you remember, oh, gee whiz, I'm supposed to be aware of God's presence. Don't beat yourself up. Just start doing it, doing it again. Try to integrate God into everything you do. Stay aware while you're going throughout your day. Offering blessing, praise, asking for advice. Talk to God. Commune throughout the day. Cultivate the habit of blessing people. That's a way to stay present to God. You're at the grocery store. Bless the person that's... Bless the people that are there. You're driving on the road. Bless the people who are there, especially when they cut you off. Bless them. Just be a blessing machine. You see, the normal mindset is self-centered. But when you begin to be aware of God's presence, uh, your awareness expands to folks around you and you start blessing them. That's a kingdom thing. This is an exercise in, God, in the kingdom of God weirdness. So the, the first discipline is the discipline of staying present with God. Um, the second discipline is similar in some ways. It is the discipline of silence and solitude. <clears throat> we live in what economists are calling the attention economy. Literally thousands of apps and devices are trying to distract you 24-7. And you have people like Tristan Harris, who is a who was a silicone you have people like Tristan Harris, who was a Silicon Valley insider who left the industry to start a nonprofit with the sole purpose of arguing for a Hippocratic oath for software designers because he's seen behind the curtain. And he's seen that right now everything is intentionally engineered by some 20 somethings in San Francisco for distraction and addiction because that's where the money is. 
Pretty much the only place left where we can be alone with our thoughts anymore is in the shower. And now that they made the Apple Watch waterproof, it's like, it's like the beginning of the apocalypse at this point. Like we might never have an original creative thought again. Now why does this matter? Because all this distraction and addiction is robbing us of the core essential human ability to be present to other people, to be present with ourselves, and more than anything with God. And in doing so, it's robbing us of our soul. As Ronald Rollheiser put it, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. Guess when he wrote that? He wrote that in 1999, before Facebook, or apps, or the smartphone. So the question is, is there a time-tested way of living that would set you and me up to thrive right in the middle of all the chaos of modern society? And the answer is yes, absolutely. It's the peculiar practice of silence and solitude. And I'm going to talk more about this next week, but for today, let's start in Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read verse 13. It says, Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said it should be done. For we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. Now look at this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. And then the story goes on. Now, all I want you to notice is that the first thing Jesus does after his baptism is go straight into the wilderness. Not sign up for a Twitter account, not start a blog, not hold a rally or an event or preach to thousands upon thousands of people. First things first, he goes straight to the wilderness. The word for wilderness in Greek can be translated wilderness or the desert, but it also can be translated as the deserted place, the desolate place, the solitary place, the quiet place, or the lonely place. And there are stories in all four Gospels, not just in Matthew, about Jesus' relationship to the solitary place. Let's look at Mark chapter 1. If you read Mark before, you know that chapter 1 is essentially one long chapter about Jesus' first day on the job as the Messiah. And it's a marathon day. He's up early in the morning and is at it all through the afternoon, well past sunset. We, re we read about that in verse 34. Then in verse 35, we read this. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, We must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Now, do you see that little pattern there? Jesus goes to the solitary place for 40 days. He comes back for one day on the job, and then he goes back to the solitary place again. This silence and solitude was woven into the fabric of Jesus' everyday life. The more busy and popular and in demand and famous that Jesus became, the more he withdrew to the lonely place to pray. Like if you're anything like me, when we, get, when we get busy at work or in family or in a season of life, usually the first thing to go is silence and solitude. But the, the solitary place was a regular part of Jesus' life rhythm. Like read gospel after gospel, story after story. On a regular basis, he would sneak away to the top of a mountain, in the middle of the night, or the, a park outside of Jerusalem, or a, clo a closet in the back of somebody's house, just to gather himself to God and to pray. Here's a working definition of silence and solitude to frame next week's expanded teaching on this. It's intentional time in the silence to be alone with ourselves and God. Now here's what we need to understand. There are two dimensions to silence, external and internal. External silence is when you go somewhere with no noise or as little noise as possible. 
no music in your headphones, no TV in the background. It's when you're out in nature or you're up early in the morning, in the quiet of your room or, or whatever. And it is, and it's quiet and quiet all by itself. Just that alone is kind of a spiritual discipline. You don't, have, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to read or pray or fast. Just quiet all by itself is a kind of spiritual discipline. The quiet does something to your soul. There's something about just not talking for a while. This may be the introvert in me, but I think that we way overvalue talking in the modern world. I'm just saying, Proverbs said, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Proverbs 10, 19. And I talk for a living. And I love podcasts and TED Talks and just information, information. But I think that we way undervalue silence. But as strange kingdom folks, we have to begin valuing the quiet because the quiet is healing and life-giving. So that is a part of silence. But then there's also the internal noise, the, the mental clutter, the the mind that just won't slow down, the, the fantasy, the revenge, the hate, the bitterness, the worry, the what ifs. Silence in our context is what it is to quiet both the external and the internal noise. And then you have solitude. Solitude is a chosen separation for refining your soul. In silence and solitude, we slow down long enough to feel all the emotions that we've been running away from. In silence and solitude, we face the good and the bad. We face our desire, our hunger, our thirst for God. We face our lack of desire for God, our insecurity or our idolatry, our fantasy, everything that lies under the surface of our life, that nasty, weird motivation, the addiction that we use to just make it through the week. All of it's exposed. But in a safe place with God, we get the right perspective on our life. Now... When we're not getting enough silence and solitude, we feel distant from God. We just feel like there's this distance between us and God. And what happens is that we end up living off somebody else's spirituality through a podcast or a book. But not only that, we feel distant from ourselves. We, we lose sight of our identity. We, we lose sight of who we are in God and our calling from God. We lose the right perspective on life. We get sucked into the tyranny of the urgent, not the important. Henry Nouwen said, Without silence and solitude, it's virtually impossible to grow in the spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside some time to be with God and listen to Him. I love it. He's blunt. He does not beat around the bush. A lot of people are well-meaning and really want to follow Jesus, want to be transformed and be a disciple of Jesus, and that's great. But if you don't work silence and solitude into your practice of discipleship to Jesus, I don't think it's going to happen. We value the presence of God through silence and solitude. And I'll, and I'll end with this. There's a book called Thank You for Being Late by Thomas Friedman. Great title. Uh, the subtitle is An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in an Age of Acceleration. And it's all about this conversation that we're in right now. And just the speed of the modern world. And he has this great quote in his intro from a CEO named Dov Seedman, who says this. It's a little cheesy, but I think it's good. It says, when you press the pause button on a machine, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, they start. You start to reflect, you start to rethink your assumptions, you start to reimagine what is possible, and most importantly, you start to reconnect with your most deeply held beliefs. I, like many of you, grew up in a church tradition where we used to use the, the language of the, the quiet time, and I love that language. I think that's right out of the New Testament. But you know, I've started to notice that I rarely, if ever, hear people talk about that anymore. I think being aware of God, being awake to His presence, having a quiet time with God, these are some of the most powerful ways of becoming a disciple of Jesus. To, to value the presence of God, we have to be in the presence of God. As we take the time and invite the Spirit of Jesus into our lives through our, our mindset and our actions, He is faithful to come near to us. He is found as we seek Him. And we have to learn to pause to seek Him. 
And I know that I'm an introvert. I know that I'm kind of a biased source because I love to be alone. I like to go walking out in the woods and read and ponder and stare off into space. I know that a lot of you are not wired that way, but this might be hard for you or it might not, I don't know. But either way, it's worth it. The best things in life usually are. In the silence, in the solitude, in the pause to be aware that you're in the presence of God. In these ways that we slow down and live opposite of how the world is going, these are the places where Jesus and countless numbers of his disciples down through the human history have found life with God. And this is a place where you can find life with God. All right, let me send you out with this blessing. Father, give us the boldness and the courage to live differently. We're all in process on this. We've got a long way to go. God, help us from feeling defeated because of, of where we're at, but rather encouraged about where you want us to be. God, I just pray that you would remind us to stay awake, remind us to say no to the normal of our life on a regular basis. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.